This week's lecture pertains to color combinations and interactions. So we'll be looking at the different types of color harmonies that can be created by looking at certain colors together from the color wheel. It's important to remember that we rarely see colors individually. Colors are surrounded by other colors and they all interact in our perception. There are two ways of looking at this basic fact. We can seek pleasing or exciting combinations of color, or we can study and exploit the ways that juxtapositions of specific colors affect our perception. The simplest color scheme is monochromatic. A single hue is used, often with variations in value and saturation to avoid monotony. In our color wheel example here, we see that the yellow color wedge has been called out. And you can see that we have the true yellow, a yellow that has been tinted with white, toned with gray, or shaded with black down below, all creating a monochromatic scheme that has some variety to it. In this photo, we illustrate a monochromatic yellow room. So you can see that the room is predominantly yellow based. We have the true yellow, in the chairs, we have the pastel version of the yellow actually in the rug, which has a light yellow cast to it. We have the darkest yellow in these olive green pillows or these olive yellow pillows, I suppose. And then we also have yellow accents in the brass coffee table and wall art, as well as the other accessories. So this room is predominantly yellow, but because we have those tints, tones, and shades, incorporated, it adds variety and prevents the room from being boring or from looking like a camouflage interior where everything blends in with itself. In interior design, monochromatic palettes can be broken up by the use of neutral colors, white, black, grays, and browns, while still preserving the desired effect of a monochromatic design. In this photo, we see that we still have a yellow room, but we have added gray to break up the yellow to add some visual relief. But just because the gray is there, it does not change the fact that this room is still a monochromatic color. We treat gray, black, white, and brown as sort of neutrals, but beyond neutral. They don't really interrupt a color scheme. So here we have this soft butter yellow seen in the pattern of the chairs, the wallpaper, the accessories, and even in the brass fixtures. But the gray adds a nice contrast, but it does not interrupt the overall color scheme. The next closest harmony is an analogous color scheme, which uses several hues lying next to each other on the color wheel. Obviously, the more colors on your color wheel, the more colors you have to choose from. So in these three examples, we see three sets of colors, all of them next door neighbors, if you will, and all of them creating analogous color harmonies. Now, analogous color schemes and monochromatic color schemes, I feel are the most enjoyed by the public, by the occupants of interiors. And I feel that the reason for that is because those color schemes are easy to understand. There's nothing about them that is overly complicated. People like being in spaces that they understand. They feel comfortable automatically when something does not seem off balance. So this room features more colors. All of the colors are coming from the fabric on the ottoman. You can see that it is a very lively multicolored pattern. When we have a inspiration fabric or wall covering or rug that is going to guide the color palette of a room, we call it the lead. So this ottoman fabric is the lead of the room. All of the colors are coming from that. Now this is an analogous scheme. We have orange, gold, and um, some red orange in here. So all of these colors have been altered with the addition of white or black, so they have been tinted or shaded but they're all next to each other on the color wheel. 
this creates a harmony, but also it adds a lot of variety to the interior because we have so much color now versus the single yellow room that we looked at before. So this room is much more, let's say interesting because there is so much going on. Depending on your taste, this might not be for you. You might like something that's much more um, understated, but the color scheme that's used here is one that makes sense to most people because the colors are all interrelated with each other. A high degree of contrast is expected in the third color scheme, that of complementary colors, in which two principal colors lie opposite each other on the color wheel. So by nature, these opposing colors, these complements, are going to amplify each other when placed next to each other, if they're moved down the color wheel and they become next door neighbors. That is just one of the telltale elements of a complementary scheme. They will amplify each other. In this instance, the purple will be more purple. The yellow will be more yellow because those complements exaggerate each other. And also, as we discussed in lecture one, when you mix two complements together, you create a neutral. So as these two would be mixed together, the yellow is neutralized, the purple is neutralized, and we create this color that is neither both colors, yet also incorporates both colors. So here we have a yellow and purple room. This is an image from an accessories catalog. So this is not a real interior as we've seen in the prior two slides. This is a staged room, but it does show off the contrast of yellow and purple. Both colors have been altered. They've had gray or they've had black added to them to darken them. So the yellow is not as bright. The purple is not as bright, but because they're complements, they're still going to make each other glow a little bit. So that's what we're seeing, particularly on the right with the yellow chair and the purple lampshade. Gray has been added in here to provide, again, visual relief. If this entire room was yellow and purple, that would just be a lot to take in. But the gray helps to relieve it. Now, there are some things going on in this room that I cannot not notice. First of all, the area rug is a big design no-no. It is too small for the furniture grouping. The perimeter of your area rug should go underneath the front legs of your furniture, at least. If it goes all the way under the furniture, that's great, but your rug should always touch the legs of the furniture. This looks like a bath mat in the middle of a living room. So that's too small. This is an accessory catalog, so it is over-decorated. Um, another issue that we have here is if you look at the sofa, we have two different end tables. That's fine, but your end table should always be the same height to create a sense of unity. If you notice the taller end table on the right, that tray table configuration, that's going to be very hard for you to function with because it's got that ledge, which will prevent you from setting a glass down easily, you're going to bump it on the side of the table and spill your drink. So we always want to be careful of that. Um, is it nitpicky? Yes and no. We always have to choose furniture that goes together, not just aesthetically, but in proportion. So this would not be a practical thing to do in a living room because you're always going to have people knocking their drinks. Um, and as I said, this is an over-accessorized interior. There's way too many pillows. There's too many tchotchkes. Um, but those two offenses, I think, are primary ones that no designer should ever commit. In a sense, complementary hues are related like two ends of a balancing device. They hold each other in equilibrium. Goth, a color theorist, felt that the eye hungers for the complement, speaking of the demand for completeness, supplying after images of the complement if it is not present. As previously stated, complements intensify each other's appearances as well. Toning down the saturation of complementary hues and raising or lowering their, lowering their value beyond the level of maximum saturation lessens the visual contrast between them as we saw in that example room where the yellow and purple had been toned down with the addition of gray. 
However, even at a reduced contrast, complements will still intensify each other's liveliness. When two hues adjacent to each other on a color wheel are used with their respective complements, such as blue-green and blue with red-orange and orange, the scheme is called double complementary. So in this graphic, we have purple and green, blue and yellow, or rather this is fuchsia and green, and then purple and yellow. These are two pairs of complements, so we call them a double complement. Here is a room using double complements. We have red and green and blue and yellow being used. We have a little bit of an orange accent as well. The more color you use in a room, the more active it becomes. If you have a client that is minimal or that wants something restful, this is not the color scheme for them. This is very vivid. All of the colors are coming out of this floral upholstery right here in the foreground, which we can also see on the pillow. So that's where everything is coming from. So that is our lead. This room also utilizes some light white pieces of furniture as well as a brown floor to break things up a little bit. But still, there's a lot of color. We've committed to painting the cabinetry in the room this apple green color. So that really carries a lot of visual weight. And then we're adding it in with the yellow wall color. So very lively. Color schemes should always be determined based on the taste of the client, not the taste of the designer. And oftentimes, a architectural style might influence a color scheme. For example, if you're working in an arts and crafts home, you might choose colors that suit that architecture. Uh, the same can be said for mid-century modern or French country. They all kind of have a color scheme that is natural to the style. Another scheme derived from complementary hues is split complementary in which the hues to either side of the complements are employed. This will soften the contrast slightly. So here in this diagram, we are using not the complement to the yellow, but the colors adjacent to that complement. So this would be yellow, purple, and blue, making up the color scheme of the room. Again, more color equals more vivid. So here we have a room of yellow, purple, and sort of a blue-green. And the yellow and the purple and the blue-green have all been tinted. They have all been put into more of a pastel frame so that they are not as intense when they're put with each other. This is, again, a very bright room, even though the lines of our furniture are quite modern and clean. Color adds some freshness. Color adds some, uh, some life to the room. Again, if you're minimal, this isn't going to be for you but it does reflect the use of these colors beautifully. And there's very little pattern. The pattern is all small scale. There's no large floral or plaid, which we can pull all the colors from. So really this room is an exploration of how these colors will relate to each other because we don't have something to tie it all together like a fabric would, which is kind of the easy way to make things coordinate. It's by finding a lead in a fabric or a wallpaper. Um, so this really is a beautiful job of coordinating. Um, the yellow dominates the walls, while the purple is mostly what we use for upholstery. And then the turquoise is an accent color. The largest piece of furniture in the room, the daybed, is of course a neutral off-white. So we can use a lot of color in spaces, but it also comes down to how we control that color. We don't want it to get out of hand because then it will become uncomfortable. Dyad schemes are combinations of two colors located two steps apart on the color wheel, skipping the color in between. So a dyad is a two color color harmony. And it can be any two colors on the wheel that are adjacent to each other, missing that third color between them. So here's an example of a dyad room. This happens to be a very perky color combination of orange and pink, but we still see that we have the dyad, even though the orange has been modified with the addition of white to pull it into a pastel shade. But dyads can be lively, they can be soothing, depending on whether or not the colors we choose are warm or cool, and depending on whether the colors we choose are 
more harmonious than another. So if we chose like blues and greens, that would create more of a harmony rather than choosing red and orange because that's a very exciting uh, color palette. A triad color scheme utilizes three colors equidistant from each other on the color wheel. So this makes kind of a pyramid shape if you were to connect them with dots. So this too is a very lively color scheme. Here we have our triad of sort of peacock green, terracotta red, <clears throat> and goldenrod. And the image is predominantly peacock green. The gold and red almost become accents, but there is still enough of them to make a showing so that they're not just little accent throwaway colors. In this room, the lead is the butterfly print as well as the striped fabric on the sofa. All of the colors come from those two elements. And because of that, it does help to make the harmony make sense. Um, again, this is a space for someone who's not afraid to use color. And a lot of your clients will be afraid. So if they want to introduce color, they're talking with you about doing it in a very uh, rational way. But then you might have color, um, clients that don't really want to do a lot of color at all. They want something more contemporary and clean. So it's up to understanding your client as well. But knowing how colors relate is always a good thing. Tetrad combinations are made up of four hues equidistant from one another, forming a square or rectangle on the color wheel. Here we have a tetrad. So again, lots of color going on in this room with the pink and the orange and the lavender and the blue, all of them equidistant on the color wheel. But again, the colors have been modified. So we have added white to a considerable amount of them to make the color lighter. And then in other instances, we have left them true, like the true blue on the chairs. This is a real room, not a display room that's used to sell products. So it is set up to be lived in. The accessories are not um, overdone. We have the color blocked decanters on the table. The pillows kind of tie everything together. The art does as well. What the designer has also done in this room is a couple of tricks that can make a room feel bigger. And I wanted to share those with you. Notice that the sofa is the same color as the wall. This is an old trick to make a room feel bigger. The sofa is the largest piece of furniture in the room and it can be a little overbearing at times. So if you do your sofa in the same color as the wall, it can help it sort of disappear and therefore the room doesn't feel overly cluttered. The designer has also done end tables with lucite bases and clear lamps. So this also helps larger pieces fade into the background. They're still present, but other items take the attention like the blue chairs, the gilded chair, the coffee table, but those items don't compete. So using elements like that, if possible, is also a good way to unclutter a room without taking things out of it. Not only do we have to physically live in a space, we have to also visually live in a space. So having the perception of more room is always a good idea. Another approach to harmonizing color is to use colors together that vary in hue, but that are similar in value. So different colors, but similar color intensity. So here I had already mentioned kind of an arts and crafts interior. The arts and crafts movement was all about earth tones and organic finishes. So in this arts and crafts interior, all of our tones go together. The browns, the greens, the off whites. But then if you look at the curtain material, we also have some reds and golds in there. And those are all the same intensity of color. So this is a multicolored room, but everything relates to itself because of the, the uh, the intensity of the color. So that's another way to bring in multicolors, but not make it look too aggressive. And here we have an arts and crafts paint palette with all the colors that would have been popular during that period. And you can see we've got turquoise and purple and gold and pink and brown and orange, but they all have the same intensity. So because of that, they harmonize very nicely.
A major factor in how well colors work together is the amounts in which they are used. Almost any colors can work together if they are used in small amounts. So this next room is a very loud room. It's a room by Tony Duquette, the American interior designer out of Southern California. He was popular in the 1960s and 70s, and his rooms were very decadent. They are what we might call maximalist interiors. Lots of color, lots of antiques, lots of accessories. Very interesting rooms, but a lot to take in. So in this room, he's used antique sari quilts on the ceiling, and they are filled with color. No one color dominates the other. The colors all work together because they're all used in small doses. And he's pulled the color for the chintz tablecloth and chair upholstery, as well as the carpet, from those antique quilts that he's put on the ceiling. But what makes it all work together is that it's small doses of lots of color. Here is another room from his home at Dawn Ridge in Beverly Hills. This room also uses lots of color, but in small doses. True, we do have his upholstered furniture pieces being done in this kind of tomato red, but the rest of the room is full of color, but in small amounts. So everything works well together. Whether or not colors are combined according to established color schemes, we should always be aware of the optical effects that adjacent colors have on each other. Successive contrast or after image is the best example of how color relationships are perceived by the viewer. Goethe, the color theorist that we will study in a later lecture, believed it was the mind's quest for completeness that caused the eye to see color complements. However, that complement will be mixed with the color of the environment it's projected into. A phenomenon that is used consciously in some artwork is that of simultaneous contrast. In this case, complementary colors or any strong contrasting colors that are adjacent will intensify each other along the edge where they meet. Joseph Albers, the artist and color theorist, observed that strongly contrasting hues of high saturation and equal value will vibrate optically along the edge where they meet, creating a sensation of transparent glowing light. So we get that effect here with these sort of color blocked color samples. We have red and green as complements. And Albers theorized that where red and green meet, because they're complements and because they exaggerate themselves and with these ideas of successive contrast and after image, where the red and the green meet, you will see vibrating light. You might see a white line. You might just see a glowing effect but it's because they are complementary colors that when they're put together like this, they create this optical illusion. We know that there's not actually light there, but our eye is sort of overstimulated by the contrast and the, the collision that it creates this vibrating effect. Joseph Albers was a German-born American artist and educator whose work formed the basis of some of the most influential art education programs of the 20th century. As an educator at the Bauhaus, he designed furniture and glass and taught Kandinsky and Klee. After the Nazis came to power, he immigrated to the U.S. and found a job via Philip Johnson, the American architect, at Black Mountain College in North Carolina. There, he taught Rauschenberg, Twombi and Asawa, all leading American artists. In 1963, he published Interaction of Color, which presented his theory that colors were governed by an internal and deceptive logic. As an artist, he is most remembered for his chromatic explorations of color depicted through images of nested squares called homage to the square. Albers also studied the possibilities of making one color look like two different colors, pushing it in opposite directions according to the background color it is seen against. Here is an example of that. We have two different background colors, and then we have two seahorses, which appear to be different colors, but in reality, they are the same. What makes the seahorses look different is the way we see the background colors, and the fact that the color of the seahorse incorporates colors of both of the backgrounds. 
in a sense, each ground subtracts its own energy from what lies upon it. This effect is most readily created with a third color that is a middle mixture between the other two. So that would be the color of our seahorse. Wilhelm von Biesold, a 19th century rug designer, discovered another optical interaction which now carries his name, the Biesold effect. He found he could change the entire appearance of his rug by changing or adding only one color. Usually this is done by altering the color that occupies the most area. This is similar to Johannes Eiten's theory of contrast by extension, which we'll talk about when we study Eiten. So here is the example of the Biesold effect. This is not a rug, this is just an assembly of squares and triangles. But his theory is that you can change the overall effect of a color combination if you change one color. And it does have to be the color that appears the most. So in the example on the left, we have these squares and triangles with the most dominant color being the gold. By changing the gold to black, you change the feeling of the composition. So black, of course, psychologically is a heavier color than yellow. Yellow is very happy and sunshiny. But also the way that the eye mixes the pinks and the blues and the greens with the yellow is different than the way the eye mixes the same colors with black. You get a sense that the colors up against black have darkened somehow, yet also become a little brighter. And then the colors up against yellow seem to harmonize a little better because there's less contrast between the yellow and the other colors. So this Biesold effect is something that we use today if you are ever out shopping at a design center looking at rugs or wallpaper or fabric, they create the same pattern in multiple colors, calling it a colorway. And each fabric or, or wallpaper as the color changes will have a different feeling. So a floral wallpaper in pink will feel different than a floral wallpaper in gray. Even though the pattern is the same, by changing the colors, you change the feeling. So that's the Biesold effect. We should also consider what happens in the spaces between colors. One of these is the phenomenon called phantom colors, where colors spread beyond their original boundaries to tint larger neutral areas in their own hue. As we saw with Surratt's pointillism, Spectral colors are applied in unblended bits on the canvas in the attempt to coax the eye to blend them optically. It not only encourages the eye to blend color, but also light. And so here we have this idea of the space between colors, colored shadows. So in our example, we have a white sphere in a white environment, white light reflecting white back into the environment. When we add a piece of red paper under the white sphere, light is being bounced back and it is pigmented red. So you can see that there's a red shadow under the sphere. The sphere is still white, but the light is colored and therefore it is coloring the sphere. When we add green to the mix, not only is there a green cast in addition to the red, but also notice that the shadow has changed as the red and green light mix together. It's not a black shadow, it's actually a blue shadow. We get the same effect with an egg, and then we also get the same effect with a color study done in paint. So here is, again, this interesting theory of the areas between colors and the idea of colored shadows. We grow up, we think that shadows are black or gray because they're dark. But much like Monet and much like Surat, we discover that color is affected by other color and that objects that we don't think change color actually do. But our mind, again, wants to give us the shorthand solution to ease the chaos in our world. So shadows are gray or black. But upon analysis, we can find that shadows are actually colored. And thus ends our lecture on color harmonies and relationships. <laughs>